and pray that the Lord speak to me at this time. Speak to me at this time. Minister to me at this point. Let your word liberate me today. Let these teachings open my eyes to see your glory in your word. Let us begin to appreciate God because He has answered our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. You may please be seated. I want to welcome all of us to the presence of God this beautiful and wonderful morning. And all glory be to God because the plan of the devil is for us not to be able to gather this morning. Because for some time now, the policy has been very heated, hot, and nobody could predict what will be happening now in Nigeria. But we thank God that we are here. We call upon the name of the Lord that he answered us. Yet there are many it is here and there, but not at that level that everybody thought it would be. So that shows that God is still in the habit of answering the prayers of his children. And because of that reason, I just want to beg all of us to please clap for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. The Lord will continue to sustain this country. Amen. And his peace will continue to reign in this country. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Today is the commencement of a series. Um, the biblical Lenten teaching series starts today. As it has been our usual practice. And we'll be looking at a very critical aspect of our central theme for this year, which is justification. And the question that we'll be trying to answer is how are Christians justified? We've been, right from the beginning of the year, we've had so many talks, addresses, Bible studies on, on justification. Now, the question we want to address throughout this Lenten season is how are we, as children of God, as Christians, how are we justified? And so, by God's grace, we'll be looking at the first one, which is, we are justified by God. We are justified by God. And um, the media team, I hope you still have the right up, please. Can you just flash on the the introduction? But before then, just before then, I want us to open our Bibles to Romans chapter three, verses twenty one to twenty six. Romans three, twenty one to twenty six. And I want it projected, if it is possible so that we can all read together. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. It's not possible for you to be on the screen? All right, then let's open our Bible. Let's read from the... Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Together. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law, 
although the law and the prophet bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Verse 26 now. It was to prove that he is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Now the introduction. Glory and honor be to God Almighty through whose grace and mercy we are alive today. This beautiful day and most especially to witness the first edition of our biblical Lenten teaching series for this year, 2023. The central theme, as I said earlier on, is justification. And for some of us that have been very active in our Wednesday corporate Bible study, and particularly in the just concluded Mission Week 2023, the meaning of justification is no longer alien to us. We've had so many definitions so many talks and addresses on what justification is. But for the purpose of refreshing our minds, I will quickly define what justification means. Justification is a legal term that means to be cleared of all blames and free from every charge clear of all blames and free from every charge. I will put it in another word. Justification in Christian theology means an act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin to the state of grace. That movement initiated by God himself that moves a willing sinner, a repentant sinner, from the state of condemnation to the state of righteousness, from the state of guilt to the state of innocency. Number two, the change in a person's condition, moving from a state of sin to a state of righteousness, especially the act of acquittal, whereby God gives contract sinners a status of righteousness. Now, justification means the forgetting of the sin, the forgiving of the sin, and rendering it void, not punishable. That's one hand. On the second hand, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ upon such a person that is justified. One leg is treated as if he had committed no sin because somebody has paid for it. The second leg is the person is now declared fit, just, and righteous. Not because of what he has done, but because of what somebody else has done, which is Jesus Christ. That's the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Justification has had importance in the history of the church since the time of St. Paul. In his letters to the Galatians and to the Romans, Paul asks, against the background of the Pharisees' legalistic piety law, how does one become just before God? How do we become just before God? His answer is, it's not by works, nor even by obeying the commandments. So this tells us that no matter what we do, the Bible says all the practice of our righteousness are like, but what? If you do rag before God. So it, it doesn't mean anything you have done. Your, 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 your act of benevolence, your act of, of giving to people, your act of showing mercy, your act of fasting, of praying, 
of whatever. Everything combined together are classified as what? Feudal rag before God. So you cannot say based on what you have done, that is why you are being justified. Every person stands before God, not as righteous, but as a sinner. Just as you have read in that Romans, that for all have sinned and what? And fall short of the glory of God. When we, as we proceed, we will, we will dig deeper on that one. How can we generalize sin? How is it possible that as, as a result of the sin of one man, every other person is made a sinner? It is God who calls the sinner righteous. That is the imputation. Okay? It is God who imputes. And there is nobody that can ask him why. Because he is unquestionable. He does whatever he likes. His authority is supreme. That is why he is God. In the human law court, only the innocent is justified. And the judge will say, I have not found you guilty of any charge as levied against you. And on that note, you are hereby discharged and acquitted. And so the, court, the judge might even go ahead and award some damages. Okay, for the inconveniences, for the debt incurred, and, and what have you. That is a human court. It is only the innocent that is what? That is acquitted. But in the tribunal of God, before all, before whom all sinners will stand, it is precisely the unjust who are declared just by God's merciful verdict. So it is, it is actually the, the, the guilty ones that are declared holy, righteous, discharged, and freed. Go and see no more. And that is that one is seen typically in that story of that woman caught in the adulterous act when she was brought before Jesus. And when Jesus Christ finished writing whatever he was writing on the floor, he raised up his head and there was nobody there. And asked, ah, where are your accusers? And the woman said, they've all gone. And Jesus Christ said, if they have not condemned you, I have not condemned you too. So therefore, go and sin no more. Pronunciation, pronouncement of forgiveness. Discharged. Acquit as if she never did anything wrong. This is not an arbitrary pronouncement, but it is made with reference to Jesus Christ. So people will say, I read some heretical teachers commenting on that aspect of God, that then God is partial. God is not truthful after all. How can he say a thing and do otherwise? He said that a soul that sinners shall what? Shall die. That is what? So why is he now imputing righteousness upon sinners? This, God did not just, does not just impute righteousness upon sinners. He imputed it because somebody had paid. Somebody has done the needful so as to free this one. Who was put to death for our trespass and raised for our justification. So Jesus Christ was put to death for our trespasses, for your sins, for my sins. The Bible says he was made a sinner. Who what? Who has no sinful nature. Who has not committed any sin by himself. But for our sins, he was made a sinner. And he was made to die like a sinner so that you and I will be free from that eternal condemnation. In this way, the sinner is acquitted from the law, acquitted from the sin and death, and he is reconciled with God and has peace and life in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So now, by way of introduction, I've introduced to us what justification means and the meaning, the impact of justification and why 
we are justified through our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, dear brethren, justification is one of the major concepts that as a child of God, you need to understand. Because out there, there are a lot of different types of teachings and sermons on it. The good news concerning God's justification of sinners by faith in Christ alone, without the addition of human deeds or church's administration, was the biblical truth rediscovered by the Protestants. One of the major core values why Luther came out vehemently against the church was the issue of this justification. He said, we are justified by grace, not by what we are doing, not by what we, are, we have done, or not by what we are going to do. It is specifically by his grace. It is a precious doctrine that is constantly attacked and misrepresented. By God's grace, in the next two weeks, we'll be talking about by grace. And you see how abused the concept of justification has been. And it is disheartening. The men of God, so-called anointed men and women of God, will climb the pulpits and preach heresies about the grace of God, abusing it and taking it for granted. That is not where we are going anyways today. It is a precious doctrine that is constantly attacked and misrepresented. Luther emphasized five solas. That is alone. Those of us that attended the, um, the mission week very well, you will understand that our missioner spoke extensively on these solas. He mentioned five of them. Number one, we are, justified, we are justified by grace alone. We are justified through our faith alone. We are justified in Christ alone. We are justified to God's glory alone. And we are justified through the scriptures alone. Five solas that the man mentioned. And he, he explained it well. So to respond to the question, how are Christians justified? The first answer today is by God. If we are justified by God, you may want to ask, then who is God? Who is God? Some people will tell you there is nothing like God. There is no person called God. That God is just an, an image created in the mind. That there is nothing like God. If not, who have seen God before? How does he look like? Who can describe him? And what have you? But I believe that you and I here believe that there is God. You don't believe that there is God, raise up your hand. So I will know where to start from. You don't believe that there is God, raise up your hand. So we all believe that there is God, right? Let us clap ourselves for that. It's a milestone. Amen. So who is God that you know? What can you say about him? If he has the power to justify, who is he? Number one, this God is the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 says what? In the beginning, God created the what? The heavens and the earth. He created everything, both seen and unseen. The river, the sea, the sea creatures, the spirits, the firmament, the mountains, the soil, the sand, the air we breathe in and out, everything, visible and invisible. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Please, can you project verse 1? Psalm 24. Let's read it together. Please project it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. That is the God we are talking about. 
He owns us. He owns everything. He is the eternal and supreme being. He is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He is unsearchable. The more you want to know about him, the more you discover that there is much more to know about him. Paul, at the, at the peak of his ministry, still cried out with the loud voice that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to know more because the more he knew, the more he discovered that there is still much more to know. Unsearchable God, eternal, uncreated creator, unmoved mover. He remains the same. He never grow old. And yet, he's not too young not to be younger than the youngest. That's why the Yoruba people call him when he so big that the whole heaven cannot contain him. And so small that even in ants is there. Eternal and supreme. Our God is supreme. When he says a word, nobody dares question him. Example, King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, and I will see that God who will come and rescue you from my hand. Today, who we'll know that God that is greater. And when the time came, he was the one that asked question, come, how many people did we cast into the fire? And they told him three. He said, no, I am not seeing three people. I am seeing four people. And the fourth one is so unique. It's not like a human being. Praise God. And after he ordered them out, he mentioned, he made a declaration that there is no God that can, what, that can save like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is supreme. When the same Nebuchadnezzar tried to question him, he said, okay, don't worry. You are a king, Abi, and I am a king. So let kings go into struggle. And he turned him to be an animal. And for seven years, seven good years, a whole king, the most powerful human being on earth as at that time, was eating grass in the forest. Supreme. Number three. Our God decides the destiny of man and no one questions him. He designed our destinies. He has the final say over all things. He has the power to do and undo. He has the power to make a life and to kill. Allah Padupe, he will kill somebody and he will still request that you still appreciate him for killing that person. And you cannot question him. Or if not, how do you explain that kind of that of thing that somebody that just lost a loved one, and the Bible is saying, In all things, give thanks, praise God. But that Job tried to question him, and when God said, Okay, you are brilliant, you, are, you have wisdom, let me ask you some questions too. When God now began to ask him questions, say, God is enough, I've just been a fool, praise God. So, our God decide the destiny of man. We are voting in Nigeria. It is only God that can decide who will win and who will not. And sometimes, they might not be the best candidate that will win. That is God for you. After all, he appointed King Saul as a king over Israel, right? And he knew the kind of person that Saul was. And he even told the Israelites, hey, you're asking for a king now. This is the kind of king that is coming. He said, we want oh, yeah, take Praise God. When you question him, when you dig, and you are not ready to submit to him, he showed himself to you the way he is. Amen. Our God is the deliverer of his children. The deliverer of his children. He delivers. Daniel in the lion's den. 
and King Darius wake up early in the morning and ran to that day. Then I said, um, Daniel, as your God, the living God whom you serve day and night, whom you pray to, been able to save you. And Daniel said, yes. Long may you live, king. I have a God who never fails. I have a God who never fails. I have a God who never fails. Who never fails. Who never fails forevermore. That was the song. That was the meaning of the, of, 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 of the response of, king, of, of Prophet Daniel to, to King Darius. The God that I serve never fails. He's alive. He has sent his angels to be with me, even the lions then. And he has shot the mouth of the lions. So they couldn't eat me. I, the lions there were not see me as a prey. They were see me as, as one of them. Because in me is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So when the lions, small, small lions of this world, sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, what do you think they will do? They will calm down. That is the kind of God we serve. That is God that we are talking about. He has the power to do and undo, to deliver his children from whatsoever shackles that they found themselves. And that is why when man was cast into the lion's den as a result of Genesis chapter 3, that sin of disobedience, it was only God that has the power to undo it, to rescue us. And that's why we are looking. That's the, that's, the, that's the point that I'm going to drive home today. That God initiated that process of justification. It was his idea. Nobody suggested it to him. He condemned man and he saved man by himself. Because he has the power to do it. And nobody else has the same power to do it. If God did not come down and save us and justify us, who will? How are we justified by God? Remember Genesis chapter 3. We all fell. I've mentioned it. Number two, the rescue mission started from the call of Abraham. That's the process. Our God is the God of process. One step leading to another. After condemning us in the Garden of Eden, driving us out of his presence and into the sinful world, into a world filled with, with all kinds and manners of things, with, with death, with sickness, with darkness, with cancer, with HIV, with prostrate cancer, with every form of sickness and disease that you can mention. Yet, he started the rescue mission. By himself. Abraham did not go to him to ask for, please, can you call me? No. It was God that saw Abraham and called him. He invited him. Get out of your father's house and go to a place that I will show to you. And you can see that story from Genesis chapter 4. 12 from verse 1. You see that long story. When you just start from chapter 12, you see the long story. God called Abraham by himself. That is the beginning of the rescue mission of man. Abraham covenant. Abrahamic covenant. God now called Abraham. When after Abraham agreed and obeyed him, now said, for this one that you have done, I am not going to stop with you. I am going to establish an everlasting covenant with you. I am going to reveal to you what I am about to do. That justification is on the way. That rescue mission has started. And through Abraham, Isaac came. Through Isaac, Israel, Jacob came. And through um, that line, the, 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 the tribe known today as Israel, came about. And of course, you remember the call of Moses. Okay? After running away for his dear life, and on that mount, the bunny bush, God called him. No. I have not forgotten my plan. So we are justified by God. He, he had, if, you read, if you listen attentively, everything that I've been saying, and you read the Bible carefully, you see, everything is about God. His ideas, his processes, his implementation, his everything. God is at the center. 
So he called Moses this time around, go back to Egypt. It is time for my people to live there. Go and tell Pharaoh that let my people what? Yes, we have much Bible students here. You have not forgotten. Let my people go. And you know that contest between God and Pharaoh. Eh? Who is that God? And God showed himself to him. Okay, I am the God. You cannot see me, but you will see my hand work. By the time that the hand of God was heavy on him, he was the one that invited Moses. Oh yeah, I have, I have decided to let you go. Just go. Leave us alone. You people have brought so much pain to us. See, when God is, is out to justify somebody, okay, he can, because of that person, kill nations. He will make his hand heavy on the enemies. And therefore I pray and I declare today that in that shackle where you are caught up with, in that bondage that you have been entangled in, today, the hands of the Lord Almighty will be heavy upon those enemies. And that will bring forth your freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen. And after that, number four, the appointment of intermediaries. The appointment of intermediaries. After God had brought out the Israelites from the land of slavery, he has established them in the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey. He now what? Began to appoint intermediaries. Okay, now the bridge that was broken in that garden of Eden has not been repaired. So you cannot still have access to me. You cannot. Because I am, I am fearful. I am, still, I am still angry with you. That, that makes me to remember that story. In Exodus, and the Israelites came up against Moses and they told him, come, is it only you that have ears that can hear God? Maybe you have been lying to yourself. Tell that your God that we want to hear him too. Let God speak to us directly. We want to hear God's voice. Say, if you are a man, we are also men. And Moses went to God and said, your people said they want to hear you. God said, no problem. I will speak to them. Tell them to sanctify themselves seven days. Wives should not go near their husbands. Husbands should not go near their wives. You should not do this. You should not touch this. This. Cleanse yourself. And surround the mountain on the seventh day. Let no one touch the mountain. No. Just surround yourself and maintain your distance. And by the time God began to speak, they shouted, No, we are dying. God, don't speak to us again. Continue to speak to Moses. Moses will be speaking to us. Amen. That is how powerful our God is. God is so powerful that he, he does not speak our language. He speaks in the language of thunder. He strikes. Amen. And so, because people could not assess him, so he, had, he, he began to appoint intermediaries, prophets. And of course, the last among them was um, um, Prophet Samuel, after Eli was abandoned by God. And it was during Prophet Samuel's reign that, you know, Prophet Samuel was both the prophet and their king, their leader. And then I said, we, we, other, other people around us are having kings, so give us kings. We want to have our own king. And God gave them some, uh, Saul. After Saul, David. And you know the story, that lineage. And it continues like that. Appointment of intermediaries. And after that, yet those intermediaries could not do it. They could not bring about that perfect reconciliation that God was looking for. God, that sin in the Garden of Eden, it's only a pure blood stainless blood that can what? Make that atonement. That can make God to forgive. And it's not just that blood alone. That blood must be placed well upon an altar that is also blameless. Amen. Now, that brought about that question, who will go for us? And Jesus Christ said, ah, we go. Amen. Amen. And so we talk about the Advent. We just finished Advent now about two months ago. Or thereafter. Advent of Jesus. And we were singing Christmas time. Celebrating the birth of Jesus. Then immediately after the Advent, we go into the Passion. Which we are, we are in now. Gradually we are stepping into. Okay? Which was kickstarted by what? By the fasting of Jesus. His baptism and his fasting in the wilderness. How are we justified by God? 
These are the processes. These are the steps that God took one after the other just to make sure that we are reconciled back to himself so that we have that access again. And after his death, the third day, just as we used to recite every Sunday, his resurrection, right? The third day, Jesus Christ told them that, see, I will die, but I will rise again. My, the purpose of my dying is to go into the hate, to go into, into hell, to fight that battle. I have redeemed you who are alive. I need to go and set free the captives in death. And he went there, and he came out triumphantly. Do you know what? At Easter, they, they, they surrounded his tomb with, with soldiers, experienced warlords, armed to the teeth with different types of arm, arm, armors, weapons. So we will see the person that will come here and rescue this body. But when the time came, the power of resurrection, nobody, nobody told them to leave. They ran for their lives. When power jumped power, you know, the, the, the broken English says, when iron jam iron, what will happen? One iron must bend for the other. They took to their heels the power of God. That is the God. Unstoppable God. That's the God we're talking about that justifies us. And the, 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 the rock, big rock that was used to cover up the grave moved by itself. And Jesus Christ came out triumphantly. And I know you will be asking, so where are you? You wanted to stop me. I am unstoppable. That's the God that justifies us. By God, we are justified. An unstoppable God. A powerful God. A supreme God. Who was, who is, and who is to come. Who has been from the beginning. And we always outlive the end. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is everlasting to everlasting. That's the God we are talking about that justifies us. That paid the price for us. And that's why I love that particular version. I mean that portion of the Bible that now there is no condemnation. No condemnation again. Because to have been justified by God himself. After all, God puts upon us the condemnation, right? And he has taken it away by himself. We are justified by him. And of course... Um, I know Sister Kemi will, will put this on our platform so that we can assess it. I've sent it to her so she can, we can assess it and read the Bible, the Bible um, um, quotations there, references there, so that we can establish all these things that I've been saying. But I would like us to open to Hebrews chapter 7. So that we can understand what Jesus Christ actually did. How he rescued us. How he justifies us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27. Hebrews 7 27. Alright. Are we there? Hebrews 7 27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices Daily. Uh -uh. That is the God that we serve. He has no need to offer sacrifices daily. Yes. For, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he was offered up himself. That is the God that justifies us. Now, quickly, the media team. Hebrews chapter 9, 24 to 28. Hebrews 9, 24. Hebrews, the same Hebrews. Let's go to chapter 9. We'll read verses 24 to 28. Together. For Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 25. Nor was it to offer... Himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place yearly with blood, not his own. For then he will have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
and just as it is appointed for men to die once. And after that comes judgment. Now, the last verse together, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, we appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That is the final level of justification. That's justification at its peak. That on the judgment day, and that is exemplified in, in, in the book of Prophet Zechariah. When, when, when the high priest appeared before the throne of God, and the devil, his accuser, was already beside him. He has changed his clothes, wore him a cloth of condemnation, and God said, no. This one is a brand that has been plucked out of the fire. The blood of the lamb speaks on this one. And therefore, remove that filthy garment and clothe him with a royal one. That is justification. That's at his peak. And it is God himself that will make that pronouncement. Amen? Amen? So you can see your place in the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 and verse 14. Hebrews 10, verses 10 and 14. Are you there? Together, let's read now. Oh yeah, oh yeah let's read together. And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He has perfected it. And that is the God that we serve. He perfected it himself. It was his idea. He implemented it himself. He did it himself. Solely without our input, without any contribution from us. And that's why I love that portion of the Bible that says, why we are yet sinners. Christ's word died for us. So that's the justification we are, we are talking about. May the Lord Almighty justify us at last. Indeed, in the name of Jesus. So to round up, let's read 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Now let's read together. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now what do you want to hear again? We are justified by God. It was his idea. He created us in his image. We sinned against him. By himself, he condemned us. And when the time came, he started the rescue mission. And he went through some processes. And at the end of it all, through his divine arrangement, he brought us back to our original position. Let us clap for God. So you are free. That is the implication. You are free because the Bible says he that the son has set free is what? He's free indeed. Free indeed. Not boya. No, no, in Nigeria when you are discharged and acquitted by a law court, it is possible, we have seen it, that even within the court's premises, the FCC will arrest him. And they will now take him to court study again. Before you know it, the following day, you will now see about 27 count charges again. Praise God. <laughs> it is only in the human court, it is only the human order that you can disregard. Thus, as the federal government has decided to disregard the, the judgment, the, the command of the, the last, the, 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 the pillar of democracy in the land, the Supreme Court. So people can decide to, to disregard others, but when it has to do with God, eh, eh, you dare not. Those who have done it in the past, they did not do it to, they attempted to do it. And of course, they reaped their labor. They reaped it well. After all, what ended Pharaoh? He perished, right? In his stubbornness, with his stony heart, he died. 
Thank God for King Nebuchadnezzar. He quickly declared, I love that king. Once he's fired, he will just come out and declare, God, you are God. No other God. Me, I am just human being. Praise God. And God would ask, okay, you have confessed. We are continuing your reign. I will not disturb you again, but don't disturb me. So God has set you free. As you are, you are free in body, in soul, and in spirit. Not because of your work, oh, by God's grace, in the fifth Sunday in Lent, we'll be looking at it. Is it our work that we are that make us to be justified? Or, or by grace of God? We are going to be looking at that. But today I just want to establish it. It is not by without your impute at all. God does give it to you on the platter of good. All you need to do is just want to key into it. And therefore, I want to beg you in the name of God, if you are here and you have not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you are wasting away. You are dead among the living. You are in crisis. You are still in that condemnation. You are still in that state. It is only those, in my definition of justification, those who are willing, the sinner, a willing sinner, who are willing to who is willing to come out of his sin, confess and ask for pardon? That is the person that is justified, though. For the Bible says, can we be in sin and expect grace to abound? God forbid. So I want to encourage you. I want to extend to you another invitation. Just in case you have not given your life to Christ. Or maybe you gave your life to him and you have collected it back. Please, rededicate, rededicate yourself and your life back to him. He's the only one that can keep you safe. He's the determiner of your destiny. He knows where you will die. The book of Job is a who is man before you. A man that cannot even add a day, that you have set a limit that he cannot what, go beyond. God has set a limit to our lives. We, whoever we are, we cannot go beyond it. Let us fear him and come back to him. As I speak, he's currently knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to justify you indeed, completely. The question is, will you allow him? And if you want to allow him, can you please bow your head and talk to him? Lord, I am ready. It is only you that can do it for me. Come and justify me indeed. Take charge of my life. I submit my life to you. The Bible says, see that loses his soul because of the gospel. We'll find it. For he that keeps it will eventually lose it. I don't want to lose my life, Lord. That's why I'm giving it to you. Keep it for me. Direct my life. I repent of all my sins, all my actions and omissions that does not bring glory to you. Please, Lord, forgive me. It is a, it's a solemn season. Okay, it's a period to ask for forgiveness. Ask him, Lord, please pardon me. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. And now I decide to follow you true and true. To do your will alone and not my will. From now on, spot, your will but not mine, O oh Lord, be done. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And if you know you said that prayer wholeheartedly, I want you to join me to sing this song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Shall we rise? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Have you decided? I, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus.